Lesson number one, uh, entitled Daniel, Revelation for Beginners. Revelation is a, um, is a book uh, full of symbolism and imagery uh, that is not really familiar to the Western mind. Uh, a lot of people look at it, uh, I've seen a lot of people interpret things you know, based on the imagery that has nothing to do with the imagery uh, of the book and what it meant to the people who first, who first saw it. Uh, it was written in a style of writing called apocalyptic. Apocalyptic. The word apocalyptic uh, comes from a Greek word which means an uncovering. An uncovering. So apocalyptic literary style, uh, which you find a lot of in the book of Revelation, uh, was used by Old Testament prophets when they were prophesying concerning world events. So when the prophets in the Old Testament were talking about the fall of a nation or great disasters, natural disasters for example, or God's judgment on a people, uh, whether it was happening right away or whether it was coming in the future, they used this kind of uh, apo apocalyptic literary style to describe what's going on. Now, there were several characteristics of this style of writing which were similar um, you know, from one author to another. Um, for example, uh, it, was, it was used in times of suffering and persecution. Different prophets would use the same style of you know, literary style, whether they were writing in 500 BC or 700 BC. You know what I'm saying? They, they, it was a style that they apprehended and used for their purpose during their time. Uh, it was also very intense and very emotional. You know, the present suffering was acute. The future salvation would be dramatic. So it's a very, you know, very dramatic style of, of writing. Uh, exaggerated, you know, the stars were falling out of the sky. The moon was full of blood. You know, that kind of uh, hyperbole, I guess. Um, they also use symbolic language, uh, dreams and visions. Uh, and the writers told stories using celestial characters such as angels and demons and so on and so forth. And they also use cosmological references uh, to the moon and the stars. You know, in Joel, the Old Testament prophet Joel, chapter 2, verse 29, 32, he speaks of the day when God will deliver his people, and that's the passage that Peter quotes in Acts. Uh, chapter, Acts chapter two. So remember I said this, this study here is Daniel Revelation, okay? Well, when we will study the book of Revelation, you will recognize this type of language throughout the book. In our study of the period when Revelation was written, you'll also see that it was a time of intense persecution um, for the church from within as well as without. So there were a lot of reasons why uh, the author used this type of, um, this type of uh, style of writing. Now most scholars agree that John, uh, the Apostle John, used this style of writing in his book in order to keep the church's persecutors, the Romans, from understanding its message. At the time, it was a capital offense to possess the scriptures. You, you could be executed for possessing the scriptures. And so what happened, a lot of the unnecessary books and things like that were uh, discarded. There were all kinds of smaller versions that were hidden at the time to keep them secret. And when a letter came out, uh, as late as this letter did, uh, the, in the 90s uh, of the, uh, uh, you know, the year 95 or so, um, and it was widely circulated, there was a great danger that if this letter fell into the hands of the Romans, uh, that the Christians who had possession of it uh, would be persecuted. And so uh, John writes in this you know, apocalyptic, uh, apocalyptic style. And if you were not Jewish, if you had no knowledge of the Old Testament, if you had no knowledge of Hebrew, if you had no knowledge of Hebrew symbolism, then you couldn't get the true meaning behind the images. It was just a bunch of, you know, wow, crazy stuff, you know, crazy stuff. So this is where we are, uh, this is where we are today. In order to understand Revelation, we first have to review some Old Testament material where a lot of these images and references are found. 
I mean, there are over 400 references from the Old Testament, but there are no direct quotes. Imagine, 400 references in the book of Revelation to the Old Testament, to imagery and so on and so forth, but no direct quotes from the Old Testament. So we need to examine Jewish symbolism and Jewish numerology in order to get the message behind the images. You know, uh, uh, in, in, imagine 2,000 years from now, archeologists, you know, they, they find uh, some records and it says, Michigan hot dogs. And they're thinking, Michigan hot dogs, what are those? Michigan hot dogs, you know? So they look through the geographical records and they say, well, this country, the United States that existed many, many centuries ago, no longer exists today, was broken up into states and one of their states was called Michigan. So we, you know, we're narrowing down you know, and hot dogs, perhaps the dogs, the, they were kind of animal, were very warm, who knows? You know the point I'm trying to get? If you don't understand the culture, then the symbolisms and the slang words make no sense to you, okay? Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll stay with my hot dog uh, analogy here, although I don't know it's go if it's going over real well. But <laughs> in French, you know, you know, in Quebec, where I come from, you can buy hot dogs, right? And they, that's exactly what they call them in French, a dog that's hot, un chien chaud, you know, and it, it doesn't make a lot of sense because the, the term doesn't come from the French language, it's just translated into the French language. So you know, I would imagine we have the same problem today. These are Hebrew terms, They're, the symbolisms made sense only to the Hebrews, didn't make sense to the Gentiles. So if we want to make sense of the book of Revelation, uh, we need to understand the terms, the symbolisms, and so on and so forth. And these are found in the Old Testament. That's why any study of Revelation uh, usually begins with the study of the book of Daniel. All right, so let's, we're going to start with the book of Daniel, all right? So let's talk about the historical setting of the book of Daniel. Uh, we know um, that Joshua led the Israelites into the land of Canaan, which became Israel, somewhere around 1410 BC. And then for the next three centuries, uh, the Israelites conquered the nations that were living there and they were uh, establishing their themselves. And then in 1060 BC, Saul becomes the first king of the united Israel. The 12 tribes are united under a single king. Saul is that king. Then in uh, 1020 BC, uh, David becomes king and subdues the entire land. He extends the borders of the kingdom from the Egyptian desert in the south to the Euphrates River in the north, uh, from the Mediterranean Sea in the west to the desert that existed in the, in the east. And then in 980 uh, BC, Solomon becomes king, David's son, and for 40 years Israel enjoys a golden period of peace and prosperity during which the temple is built in Jerusalem. Well, after Solomon dies and the kingdom is divided in two, there was a civil war between his son and, and others. Uh, the northern kingdom uh, made up uh, uh, was one division of that divided kingdom. Ten tribes gathered together. Uh, Shechem was its capital for a time, then uh, Penuel, and then Tizra was the capital of the northern kingdom. And then the southern kingdom made up of two tribes with the capital of Jerusalem. And strangely enough, the north was called Israel and the south was called Judah. Um, the two were never reunited and they competed for dominion, uh, dominance rather, in the region. And after the split, there was a decline in moral and religious fervor in both of the kingdoms as periods of high uh, infidelity, if you wish, um, to the Lord followed each. So they, they were faithful under Solomon, but when they broke up, the north, the south, the north especially, went into idolatry rather quickly. The south followed, but not as, not as quickly as we'll see. Now, during Israel's development from 1400 BC to its divided kingdom in the ninth century, 
one nation dominated the world scene politically and militarily for almost five centuries, and that was the, the Assyrians. Their capital was to the north of the northern kingdom. Uh, it was in Nineveh, and the Jews often had to pay tribute or fight off this strong and wicked neighbor uh, of theirs. And, and that's where, remember Jonah, the book of Jonah, Jonah was sent to Nineveh. And the reason that Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh is because Nineveh, the Assyrians, had punished uh, the uh, Israelites uh, so often uh, for not paying their dues. They had invaded them. They had enslaved the people. There were wars. And so the last thing that Jonah wanted to do was go to Nineveh, the capital of their enemy, you know, the capital city of their enemy, and preach to them so that God would save the city. I mean, what Jonah wanted was that for God to, to destroy Nineveh, and destroying Nineveh, it would be destroying their, their major enemy. And we know the story of Jonah, finally. Uh, uh, God gave him an offer he couldn't refuse, and uh, the fish uh, spit him up, and he went to, Jonah, uh, he went to Nineveh, and he, uh, and he preached. So, let's keep this in mind, the Assyrians, shall we? In 722 BC, the uh, Assyrians attacked and destroyed the northern kingdom and they scattered the people throughout other nations and they brought many into exile into Assyria and that's how Assyria handled uh, their conquests. Uh, they would conquer a nation and then they would take the people of that nation and spread them out to other nations in order to dilute their nationalism by diluting their bloodlines. And so they would force a nation to intermarry with surrounding nations. And uh, their idea was that in several generations, people would have less uh, fidelity to the old ways, to the old country, to the old nation's ideas, and so on and so forth. So that's exactly what they did to the Israelites, the northern tribes. They just scattered them among other uh, nations. And of course, for the Israelites, the other nations were pagan nations and they were forced to intermarry and to settle in other countries and so on and so forth. They also brought foreigners to live in the northern kingdom and of course mixed with the Jews that remained there. Well the result was that the northern kingdom and population were mixed with foreign nations. They lost their pure Jewish blood and their heritage. And these mixed Jews were eventually called Samaritans by their southern neighbors. They were despised, A, because of the mixed blood, and B, because of the mixed religion, because the northern tribe mixed Judaism with paganism. So their religion had some parts of Judaism, but also other parts of paganism, pagan worship. And so the southern uh, tribes, the two southern tribes, rejected them because of this. And of course, uh, the northern tribes, after a time, began to collaborate with other nations against Judah. And so that was another reason that the southern kingdom was not very friendly to the Samaritans uh, because of that. Meanwhile, on the world stage, a new power was emerging to challenge the Assyrian uh, supremacy. And in 612 BC, the Babylonians destroyed Nineveh, the Assyrian capital, and they established themselves as the world rulers. And so in 606 BC, the Babylonian army, led by future king Nebuchadnezzar, captured Jerusalem, and he carried off the main leaders, the nobles, the royalty, to Babylon, where they will begin 70 years of captivity which was prophesied by Jeremiah back in 626 BC. 20 years before it actually happened. 20 years by the calendar before the Babylonians actually came in to destroy and capture Jerusalem, Jeremiah prophesied that this would happen and that they would be taken into captivity for 70 years. And they were in captivity for 70 years according to his prophecy. Now you need to understand the Assyrian style of conquering was that they would mix you know, the, the people that they conquered with other nations and dilute them and weaken them. That's how they did it. The Babylonians had another strategy. What they did is they kind of scooped off the cream of the crop of the nation that they had conquered. 
the, the, you know, the best and the brightest, okay? They took those and they brought them back to Babylon and they trained them in the language and the literature and the politics and the history and the art of Babylon. In other words, you know, they, they remade them into Babylonians. And once they were fully trained, fully loyal, then they would send these people back into their nations in, in, in leadership positions in order to influence their former nation um, in the ways of, of Babylon. Just a whole different strategy on how to conquer and to rule um, a nation. Now, among the leaders and young nobles that were carried off at this time was a young man called Daniel, who would grow in importance and prestige in the foreign king's court because of his ability to interpret dreams and prophecy. He was bright, you know, he was among the bright, but his value to the Babylonian king was not his ability at math or politics or science. It was his ability to interpret dreams. Um, um, also taken away at this time was the prophet Ezekiel. The prophet Ezekiel was also carried off at this time and he was the prophet to the people who were in exile in Babylon while Jeremiah remained back in Judah and he was the prophet to the people who remained in uh, Judah during this uh, time. So God allowed His people to be taken away into exile, but He provided for their spiritual needs. As I said, Daniel was in the palace, was influencing the king with his special gifts. Ezekiel lived among the people and he ministered to them with his teaching and his prophecies. As a matter of fact, it was during this time while the Israelites were in Babylonian captivity that the synagogue, the idea of the synagogue began. There were no synagogues before the, the uh, captivity. But while they were in captivity, the Jews wanted to maintain their religion. They wanted to maintain you know, their faith in God, many of them. And Ezekiel, of course, was there to encourage them. And so they began meeting in their homes for prayer, for the reading of scripture, for mutual edification, for praise, for encouragement. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> and so uh, that's where the, 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 the rise of the synagogue movement began during the uh, Babylonian captivity. And after the Jews came back to rebuild the temple and to rebuild the city, they also brought back with them this idea of the synagogue and established synagogues, not just in homes now, but actually separate buildings in order to worship and to pray and so on and so on. Now they still had the temple where they would go do the feasts and where they would offer sacrifice. They didn't do that in synagogues. But now this new element in their spiritual development um, uh, was, um, uh, was, was present. All right, so uh, 20 years later, in 586 BC, after the king who had been left in charge of the southern kingdom by the Babylonians rebelled, his name was Zedekiah, 20 years, he's under the thumb of Babylon. He figures, you know, we're going to rebel. We, we're going to throw off the yoke of Babylon. And so what do the Babylonians do? They return to Jerusalem. They destroy the temple this time and they destroy the city and they carry off even more Jews into captivity. As I say, uh, as I mentioned before, the Babylonian system was to carry off the leaders and retrain them in Babylonian culture. So uh, in 539 BC, and if you notice this first lesson is just history, I'm just setting it up for you, okay, so we know where we're at, give you a little background as to how the book of Daniel was written and why. So in 539 BC something else happens on the world scene. The Medes conquer the Babylonians and the new world leader is a man called Cyrus who becomes king in 536 BC. Now in that same period this king releases the Jews to return to their homeland and provides them with help to begin rebuilding the temple and the city. During this time around 534 BC Daniel dies while in captivity in Babylon which is now controlled by the Medes. From about 500 to 332 uh, the Medes share world power with another mighty nation 
called Persia. And so you have the Medo-Persian Empire that develops. And it's during the reign of the Persian kings that the city of Jerusalem is finally completed, the temple is rebuilt, Ezra, the prophet, reestablishes the law, Malachi, the prophet, begins to prophesy to the people who have resettled in Jerusalem, and Nehemiah returns to rebuild the wall. All this happens 486 all the way down to 400 BC. And so Old Testament history ends in 400 BC, in other words, 400 years before Christ, four centuries before Christ with the work of Malachi. Now, in the world, there are two other historic events that take place that have great significance for the world and also for the coming of Jesus and the spread of the gospel. One of these is Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great conquers Persia. Notice I'm, I'm, I'm saying you know, the Assyrians were in charge and then the Babylonians were in charge and the Medes were in charge and then it was the Medo-Persians who were in charge and now Alexander the Great comes along and he conquers Persia in 331 BC and Greece now becomes the new world power. We know that Alexander dies soon after in 323 uh, BC, and he died in Babylon, by the way. Uh, it is said that he had a broken heart because there were no other nations that he, he could conquer. He lived to conquer other nations. And then in 146 BC, Rome destroys Carthage and puts an end to the Greek dominance of the world and will become the new world power for the next 500 years. Now, we need to understand that there is a story within a story going on here. And let's face it, if you've taken you know, history classes and so on and so forth, you know that I have gone through 1400 years of world history here in about 20 minutes. But I just want to show you the high points because we're going to come back to these as we talk about Daniel and Revelation and the visions that Daniel has and the visions also, excuse me, the visions also that, uh, that John will have. So I said uh, to understand um, that there is a story within a story going on here. First of all, there's the story of the Jews, the Jewish people. The Bible tells us the story about their kingdoms being destroyed by foreign armies. The Bible tells us about their people being carried off and, and uh, two of their people, Ezekiel and Daniel, writing about their various experiences. And then there's another story going on at the same time here, and that's the story of world kingdoms. Through the Bible accounts of the uh, experience of the Jews, we can trace the rise and fall of five world powers which historical records confirm. As I said, the Assyrian Empire, the Babylonian Empire, the Medo-Persian Empire, the Greek Empire, and the Roman Empire. Now, the Bible doesn't talk about these, like it doesn't give you the details, you know, the rise and fall of the Roman Empire and so on. It doesn't give those details. When you read about, when you read in the Bible, what's in the forefront is the story of the Jews. That's the story that we're reading about, about the Jews. When they were in exile, when they rebuilt the temple, you know, when Jesus came, the prophets, so on and so forth. That's the story that's in the forefront. But the story that's in the background Okay, like scenery almost, if you wish, is the story of these five kingdoms. Because the Bible does mention the various world powers. It doesn't give a lot of detail about them, but enough detail to understand that the story of the Jews is set within the context of the stories of all these world powers that were taking place. And so the, um, um, uh, the significance of this is important for several uh, reasons. First of all, uh, much of Daniel's visions and dreams and interpretation and prophecy will chronicle the rise and the fall of these world powers and the eventual coming of the Christian age at its proper point in history. In other words, the Bible is talking about Daniel, a historical figure, talking about and making prophecies concerning world powers that history, secular history, actually records. 
Okay? So you have exact historical prophecy that can be verified through historical records. That's, that's pretty amazing. That's pretty amazing. When Daniel uh, prophesies the rise and fall of the next four kingdoms in history hundreds of years in the future and he nails the order, that's, that's pretty amazing proof that the Bible is something very special. It's not just another book, it's not just a religious book, it's not just a history of the Jews, but it is something that has been written, has been conceived by a power much greater than man, because no, we can't even tell what the weather's going to be like in two days. You know what I'm saying? With all our gadgets and equipment. Here you have an individual, you know, thousands of years ago, who predicts the rise and fall of four great kingdoms four world powers. So one of the strongest proofs for the inspiration of scripture is the book of Daniel. Um, in 605 BC, Daniel begins to predict the rise and fall of four world powers into the next 600 years. And he calls them exactly in the order that they rose and they fell. And then the uh, language and the symbols and the prophecy are directly related to the meaning and the interpretation of the book of Revelation. In other words, if you don't understand what's going on in Daniel, you're not going to understand what's going on in the book of Revelation. That's why you start there. That's why so many people make mistakes with the book of Revelation. They don't read Daniel and then they extrapolate on the symbols and they, you know, they make it mean what they want. But the first rule of good Bible study is to ask the question, what did this mean to the people to whom it was originally addressed. And when you figure that out, then and only then can you make applications to what it means to us today. But if you skip that step, you risk making some uh, mistakes. And so we're going to start the study of Revelation by studying Daniel, because its history, its prophecy, its language, its images relate directly to similar features in the book of Revelation. All right, so let's just kind of bring all this together here and close this out. The book of Daniel was written by Daniel, who was a young Jewish man from the upper classes of Jerusalem society. He was carried off into Babylonian captivity in 606 BC and wrote this material between 606 and 534 BC when he died. Now his main abilities uh, were in interpreting dreams and visions and prophecies. He was an instrument of God placed specifically in a certain place and time for God's service. Um, his book was written in two languages, Aramaic and Hebrew, and the book of Daniel is divided into three sections. First, it's chapter one, which is an introduction to the entire book. Chapters two to six describe Daniel, his three companions, and the experiences that they encounter in Babylon. So it's kind of a history of what's going on. And that's the easy part to understand. You know, we were here, we did this, we said that, and so on and so forth. Pretty easy to, to follow, fascinating historically. But then chapters seven to 12 narrates visions that Daniel has concerning world powers and their relationship to the kingdom of God. And that's the important part. Because Daniel said there's going to be four, four world kingdoms that come up, and then that fifth kingdom that will come, that last kingdom, will be God's kingdom. And so Daniel is one that very clearly prophesizes the coming of Christ and the establishment of the church in the clearest of terms uh, from the Old Testament. Okay, so that's the material we're going to cover this week. Next week, we're going to start studying the book as a way to prepare uh, for our study, the book of Revelation. Remember I said, Daniel Revelation for beginners, we have just a quarter. We got 13 weeks of this, so we're not going to get bogged down too much in a line by line description. We're going to take it in chunks, okay? But hopefully by the end of the study, you'll have a firm grasp of both of these books and the important parts of these books. So that's it for this time. I hope you'll be with us next time when we study the book.